First, I'd like to thank Nathan and, oh. and Carl Lili and Antonio uh, for inviting me to, these, to this workshop. And I find these uh, events very interesting and an opportunity to really get out of administration for a while and out of a suit for a while. So that's, that's very nice. So um, I thought I would give an introduction uh, to the interfaces between combinatorial optimization and physics. And there's been a group of us working on this for maybe 20 years. So this is a talk I gave at a conference that Bruce Hendrickson organized in 2007. And uh, at that time, Bruce and I were, were talking a lot about applications of combinatorial optimization. And uh, I uh, gave a talk, and it was mostly people from the combinatorial optimization community. And they found it very interesting, so I thought I'd, you know, give you a quick overview before I get to the unassigned distance geometry problem. <clears throat> These pictures indicate some solutions to physics problems that my group has uh, calculated over the 10 years prior to 2007. Uh, and in each case, uh, the algorithms we used were from computer science, kind of standard algorithms. So um, this is an example of uh, bacterial growth. And uh, there's an interest in looking at the shape of growths to distinguish, for example, between a cancer and non-cancerous skin lesion. It turns out that cancerous skin lesions have a fractal kind of surface, whereas ones that are not cancerous have a more self-affine surface. This is the surface that you get when you run Dijkstra's algorithm. So Dijkstra's algorithm, you usually look for a shortest path. However, during the growth, so embedded here, I didn't show you, is a, uh, a grid, a square grid, and each of the links in the square grid has an energy or a capacity. And when you do Dijkstra's algorithm, you can look at all paths from the center here through that random environment. And what you see coming out of it is this surface. There are mappings between this surface and the dynamics of growth. And that's fairly well known. The transformation is something called the Kada Parisi Zhang growth surface. And uh, the paths you get from Dijkstra are, are shortest paths. Uh, this is the one I'll talk about today. This is, this is the unassigned distance geometry problem. This is one example we reconstructed. It's a Leonard Jones cluster. It's a minimal cluster when you have all pairs interacting with a Leonard Jones potential. So if you take the distance list out of something like this, it's easy to reconstruct with the algorithms I'll tell you about later. Uh, this is an example of the graph rigidity problem. So in the graph rigidity problem, what we're trying to do is figure out whether a set of points connected with edge, edges uh, will resist a stress. And you can map that problem in a generic graph to matching. And this was one of the important things that Bruce Hendrickson developed, showed us how to do that. And then several groups, including mine and Mike Thorpe's groups, developed algorithms based on that to study percolation processes. So again, that's a random graph, and you ask the question, if I have a stress applied at the base of the graph, will it propagate across the graph? It's very analogous to connectivity percolation, where you ask the same question about flow, in which case you have uh, connections which have a flow capacity. And you ask, can flow get from one side to the other? It turns out that this problem is harder than uh, the flow problem, scalar flow problem, because stress is a vector. So we think of it as vector percolation in the physics community, and it maps to graph rigidity. And this has had a very significant impact on the ability to really characterize the properties of rigidity processes in physics. This is an example that we had a collaboration with Sandia Labs, and they were interested in um, fracture surfaces. So if you have a material, this is a polycrystalline aggregate. The grain boundaries in the material all have different energy. So you can ask the question, well, what is the cohesive surface in the material that has the minimum total surface area, or minimal total energy? Did you get the cold wind? Yes. <laughs> I got the coldest place in the whole world. No, 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 no,
Uh, there's another one right there. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> so so um, you can, we can solve this problem. It turns out that min cut max flow can be mapped one to one to problems like this in the energy of surfaces. So the capacity maps to energy, and then you can artificially add a uh, injection flow links and an extraction flow target, and then do min cut max flow. Um, a, a more subtle case is random field icing models, which don't obviously map to anything, but in 1988, Andrew Ogielski, who was at Bell Labs at that time, figured out a connection between these kind of problems where you have spins, which can be up or down, and if you have local fields which are random, meaning the fields might prefer up or down randomly, site to site, but the exchange constants, the neighboring interactions, would like to have ferromagnetism, then you can get configurations like this if the fields are strong. As the fields get stronger, the random fields drive the configuration and it can be completely random. When the exchange constants are stronger, then it turns eventually into all one domain. This also maps to min cut max flow. And so finding uh, accurate and fast algorithms for uh, shortest path, minimum spanning tree, um, min cut max flow, and there's also applications of minimum cost flows and several other of the standard algorithms from computer science uh, occur. Uh, so I'm go not going to talk in detail about any of the problems except the, the case, the unassigned or the assigned distance geometry place, uh, case, which is related to um, rigidity. So this is back in uh, 2005, 2004, and at that time we were using these matching algorithms to identify rigid structures in graphs with the purpose of asking the question I asked before, that is, how many edges do you need in a graph in order for rigidity to propagate? And we were co uh, comparing to connectivity uh, percolation. And the first statement uh, that we can make, a very easy statement to make, is to make uh, a system rigid, you need more edges than to make it connected. But how many more? So here's where we start counting. So how many edges do we need in a graph to make it internally rigid? So let's, uh, we'll, we'll do all dimensions, so. We'll just take, we'll consider bar joint networks. <clears throat> so we have um, points. And now we're going to start adding bars. And bars are rigid. So these are a lot like what we're worried about when we do reconstruction from uh, sets of distances. The distances in the ideal case are fixed. So we'll think of these as distances in the distance geometry application. So we're going to add a certain number of distances. The properties of the joints is that they are freely rotatable in the sense that these bars can rotate, but this distance cannot change. It's fixed. The joints fixed, uh, sorry, the bars fix the distances between joints. So each bar is one constraint. And now we ask the question, each joint has k degrees of freedom. They're just the k translations of a point in k dimensions. Now let's imagine we make a rigid body in k embedding dimensions. So we have to keep in mind that eventually,
So a rigid body in k dimensions has rotations and translations. So the number of rotations of a rigid body, just think of this thing rotating, in two dimensions it has one rotation, in three dimensions it has three rotations, in general the number of rotational degrees of freedom is k outside of k minus 1 over 2, that's the rotational degrees of freedom, plus the k translational degrees of freedom. So the total number of degrees of freedom of a body in k dimensions is k out of k plus 1 over 2. And when we fix an object and want to reconstruct in k dimensions, we have to figure out how to fix those. We don't want to have to be dealing with them because they're continuous degrees of freedom that don't tell us anything about the structure. So there's lots of ways to fix those. So if we go back to asking our question here, our question is, how many bars do we need to make a reconstruction? Or in the graph rigidity sense, how many bars do we need to make for that system, that graph, to be rigid? Okay, so let's look at a couple of cases to show that there's some subtleties here. Let's look at uh, uh, planar examples. So let's take that. So I have a system here with uh, four vertices and five edges. Is that rigid? How many would say yes, that is rigid? <laughs> In two dimensions. How many say no, it's not rigid? So we have two people who say it's rigid and nobody else has an opinion? <laughs> Okay, so if you say yes or no, you're right, because the question's not well defined. Okay, it's locally rigid. So if you look at this thing here, if you take any point in this uh, system, you cannot continuously deform it. So that's what we mean by local rigidity. for this case. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about universal rigidity, which is a very interesting topic, but I'm not the expert or knowledgeable enough to try that, so I'll stick to fixed embedding dimensions. I'll talk about two or three usually. So this is locally rigid, but it's not globally rigid. It's not globally rigid because I can make another configuration of this where I Rotate that, if I can draw this well. You didn't list the reflections in your degrees of freedom, just the rotations and translations. Yes, I did. So, up to your definition of uh, degrees of freedom, that's rigid. <laughs> I consider this a, a rotation of one body with respect to the well, other. You don't need dimensions, you don't have the space to rotate. Uh, yeah, but we, we don't count reflections in this count ever. Right, but then that's rigid. I, I like her answer. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, okay, so this is globally rigid. Excuse me? Globally not Oh, sorry, not rigid, yeah. <laughs> uh, so these are the examples that uh, Khalili and his group are talking about as being discretizable. So discretizable cases are where there are no continuous uh, deformations, but there are these global uh, reflections. Uh, <coughs> so 
the important statement for reconstruction of distances from distances is that if we now add another edge, <coughs> in a rigidity sense, in a graph rigidity sense, this is a redundant bond. And you need one bond which is redundant in, a, in order to fix this global reflection. So this is uh, globally rigid. And if it's globally rigid, and, it's the, and the framework we're reconstructing, uh, reconstructing does not have any um, non-generic uh, uh, structures, then this leads to a unique <coughs> realization. So that's key. Now we know how many edges we need, or how many distances we need, if these distances are exact, in order to get a unique realization. Now the caveats. Yeah. Do, do you always need one redundant, or is it dependent on the case? One is enough, uh, provided the domain is spanned by that rigid bond. Because you can imagine a rigid bond that is in, let's, let's imagine we make a graph like this. and I put an additional over-constraint in here, that will fix that part of the structure. It will not fix this part. So, so the answer is no. <coughs> but if you have a clique, the answer is yes. Um, so, uh, of course, this is up to rotations, translations, and reflections. And provided there's no non-generic configurations. <clears throat> so, what that means is I can understand how many distances I need just from graph rigidity. That gives us a tool, right? We can now look at our structures and scan them with a rigidity algorithm and figure out which parts I can even hope will be rigid and which parts I can therefore hope I can reconstruct. If I don't have that property, I'm, I'm lost. I don't have enough constraints to reconstruct. And there are a lot of non-generic cases that we have to be aware of. So a famous one <clears throat> So here are two bodies in two dimensions. Both are rigid. And if you do the counting arguments, these uh, bodies will be, now if I could really connect that, so uh, let me draw these parallel. If these three bars were not parallel, that would be rigid. If they are parallel, it's not, because there's this. So this is an example of a non-generic case. And that's a case for which the matching alg algorithms fail. Because matching algorithm would say that's rigid, whereas in reality it's not. So there's cases in reconstruction that could be the same. So in reconstruction, everything we talk about that are based on these counting arguments are for the generic cases. Okay, so um, let's go back to the statement about uh, bar joint Counting. So, so you could do this with the gram matrix as well. I would guess so, yeah. I haven't, I haven't thought about it too much, but I think it's the same. It's the same counting. <coughs> um, so, uh, cliques. 
you can figure out how many redundant bonds there are in cliques. So if you look at a clique, um, so the statement is, if the size of a clique is equal to k plus 2, <coughs> and you can figure out pretty quickly, there is one redundant bond. <clears throat> and you can do the counting. What you have to do is uh, match the number of degrees of freedom. So this is the constraint counting. The number of degrees of freedom is um, we have a k times n. That's the total number of degrees of freedom of all of the points in the clique. Then we've got to subtract the, I'll call this degrees of freedom of the body. That's the rigid body. So they're the relevant degrees of freedom that are internal to the structure, right? I've subtracted off the global degrees of freedom that are kind of trivial. And then I have a certain number of bars. <clears throat> and how many bars do I have in a clique? So it's the size of the clique. So it's a uh, number of <clears throat> nodes in the clique, number of nodes in the clique minus 1 over 2. just a complete graph. And so you can solve this and figure out how many, the, the, fir the first time this, there's an equality here, the size n at which there is equality here. That will tell you how big a clique is when the number of internal degrees of freedom is equal to the number of bars in the clique. From that you can figure out, um, <clears throat> you can figure out the critical clique size, and that's the size I gave here. So in two dimensions, four atoms, and the number of bonds associated with four atoms, which is uh, k plus 2, k plus 1 over 2, um, <clears throat> has one redundant bond. And then uh, if you do the same thing in three dimensions, you have five atoms. So that plays an important role in reconstruction. Because once you have one redundant bond, you have global rigidity. And then you can build from that to build up the whole structure. So everything we do in our assigned and unassigned distance geometry problems use, call this thing a core. So what is the core of the reconstruction? It's the size of a structure that has one redundant bond. So we have a unique realization in a generic sense with precise distances. And that's about all I need about rigidity to, to start talking about distance geometry. With the one exception that now we're going to, to say, okay, let's say we are successful and we're going to do build up. <clears throat> so all of these build up algorithms work as follows. First step is find the core. The second step is iteratively <coughs> um, you add k plus one edges and one node. Then you do that iteratively. So all of the growth, all of these, these, these uh, procedures work that way. This has been known for a long time. So if you have the assigned uh, case and you can do this iteratively, it's an order and algorithm. So you can do millions of sites. 
So what we're doing, let's say we have some structure, we've already reconstructed, or we've found from experiment, it's actually a pretty good strategy, get your experimental friends to go really characterize very carefully a piece of the structure, and then you can use that to build the rest. So in order to do this, there are some caveats here, and I'll, I'll write them in a second, but we have to choose a set of, let's say in two dimensions, <coughs> I'm going to choose uh, k plus 1 edges uh, connecting to k plus 1 connector sites. I'm going to choose another node that's compatible with the k plus 1 edges. There's k plus 1 edges there in a node. And they've got to be compatible. And there I have the next site in my reconstruction. And then you just do that iteratively. So. Why are we interested in having exclusively one realization of the uh, after reconstruction? Why can't we be interested in having several? You because can, here yeah. you are artificially asking for a lot more conductivity than yeah. would uh, warrant rigidity. Yeah. I mean, local rigidity right. could be already okay. Yeah. You're asking for global rigidity. Yeah. Why? In proteins, we don't do this, so I'm yeah, yeah. just interested in that. Because in physics, we're mostly interested in a, a rigid structure. But the real answer is, we've got to solve this first, and then we can do the more complex cases where you look at many options. I don't, I don't just just computationally more complex. Oh, computationally. All right, but here you might fail to find it at all. You might, you might end up with something which is infeasible in a way, because you, you can't find all that many connections, and so you conclude that there is no structure. Yeah, that's, it is possible, but the number of such cases is small compared to the number that are reconstructed this way. So yeah, it's true, that's, uh, yeah. In cases like so that, you'll do something else. rich in distances in, in this application, do I, I imagine? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we're usually rich in distances, but they have errors. So the, oh, okay, we, okay. we have the, we have plenty of distances. So the challenge is different. The, yeah, the challenge is different, yeah, right. And I think the same too as proteins. Like when you look yeah. at proteins, they do 10, 10 times the number they need Distances. of distances to constrain the structure, and they do so because they have such uncertainty. So really, it's dealing okay, with the uncertainty. Okay. So, you know, this, this also is what Khalili is thinking about and we're thinking about too. Is let, let's say we now have intervals here. Is there anything we can say about how many more edges? Well, we can keep on doing this, right? There's no reason why not. That's the, what I described as the minimal set. We can add, if we have 10 times, we might have 10 edges there. The question is, given a certain interval size, at what, how many such edges do we need to fix that point to high probability? What is the error on that point? So that, that question has not been answered. When, is the, when there are intervals here, it's, uh, that's probably the biggest outstanding problem. And I think doing this problem first is, is a good way to get to the harder uh, cases. Uh, so this is basically the algorithms that are used for build up. Um, so now I'll switch to, well, now back to PowerPoint, so <clears throat> this is talking about basically what I was saying on the blackboard, we're reproducing uh, a set of point positions from distances. But you know, the generalization to vectors is not hard. In fact, the vector case is easier because you have more information. Each vector you can replace by distances. There's certain implied distances. What it means is now we have correlated distances. So there's some interesting questions there about how many such correlated distances you need. So at the end, I'll talk a little bit about vector buildup. Um, so we now have four problems. We have assigned, unassigned scalar distances, and we have assigned, unassigned vector distances, and then you can mix them. So there's a whole world of different things we can, we can play with. <coughs> Excuse me, vector distances mean you know the vector, you know the direction. Yeah. Okay. So in two dimensions, there's only one angle. In 3D, obviously, there's several variants. We can have one or two angles, and as you go higher dimensions, there's a whole set of variants. But each, vec each angle gives an implied distance. Yeah, single or just two. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, and I, I put the nanostructure problem in the title, so I felt I should define it, and here's the definition. And it's basically saying it's solving the problems we've always been, we've been talking about. 
But it was a new thing in the world of condensed matter physics uh, when people started to think about not using crystals and trying to find the atomic structure of nanoparticles and other systems that are not crystalline, it, uh, it was considered a very hard problem. So this paper that Simon wrote with his colleague uh, in 2007 kind of articulated that. And it's basically the same as the protein problem. Of course, the details are different, but it's the same problem. Uh, and these are some of the applications that are ongoing. One of the, the interesting things in the drug discovery world is that you have to um, crystallize a, a, a drug system in order to patent it. So you know exactly what the structure is. That's been the tradition. What if you can't crystallize it? Then you can't patent it. So, so, so uh, Simon was asked by some of the people working on drug discovery to see if he could predict a structure without crystals. It hasn't led to anything significant yet, but that was the question that they asked him. Uh, so now here's a definition of the assigned and unassigned distance geometry problems. So consider that simple structure there, and it's a complete uh, set of edges. And if it's in the unassigned variant, all the information I give you is this. So you don't know anything else. You don't know the graph. And compare that to the matrix uh, case. Now, of course, there's no matrix completion required here. It's got the whole matrix. So this is the case of a complete distance list. And this is the case of a complete matrix. Now you can imagine the cases where you start removing some of these distances. And then you would ask the matrix completion. And over here, you could remove some of these and ask about whether you can find the structure given a certain number of distances. The theories about rigidity, of course, apply. The number of these distances you need has to be at least the number of edges you need to make a graph globally rigid. Otherwise, you have no chance, at least no chance in getting a unique realization. If you have something that's locally rigid, then you can explore a discrete set of combinatorial solutions. And once you have continuous deformations, you could define the range of those deformations. But the simplest case is where there's a unique realization. And there, you need global rigidity. Uh, so now, let's imagine trying to solve this problem for a large uh, graph. Let's say we have a point set with 500 points. And what we have to do if we have this case is somehow figure out where each distance sits in the graph. If we have a complete graph, it becomes what looks like an impossible problem because we have n factorial assignments and we have no way of really figuring out how to, to find them. So the first instinct I had when Simon actually brought this problem, he, I'll tell you where it comes from in a minute, but he brought this problem to me and my first reaction was, that's just way too hard. I'm not interested in looking at that. It's ridiculous. Let's, let's just stick with what everybody's doing now, which is global optimization. You do simulated annealing, you find some structure and everybody's happy. And the problem was that from the data that Simon was generating, you can generate many different structures uh, and the theoretical basis of those structures was very um, uncertain. So there's lots of papers in the literature where people have found structures and published them, but the alternate structures are not there. So we don't have any idea either how many structures are, there are or whether the structure that's published is even close to the correct structure. This was the challenge that Simon faced, and at the time he had a big grant from the NSF uh, to provide the software for the Oak Ridge uh, scattering beam lines. And of course, the Department of Energy wanted validated methods. They would like to know that the structures their data are generating are somehow validated. And at that time, the answer was, well, we know how to get good structures. And then we'll do some other experiments and see if we can check <laughs> that the structures we're finding are right. So what usually happens in the physics literature is people will predict a structure, then people do other experiments, and they'll say, hey, that's wrong. And then they'll go back and look for another structure and see if they can fit the data with that. So it's really experimental iteration that resolves the issue. 
Simon was hoping that we could work together and figure out how to solve these problems in a more formal manner, and that's where we got involved in this problem. So here's our problem stated uh, in, in pictures. Let's say we have a fullerene, and uh, we make a histogram of all of the distances in a fullerene. That's what that looks like. And you can see the numbers here are very high. There's a very high degree of degeneracy in the fullerene. There are 21 unique distances, whereas the number of distances is 60 times 59 over 2, which is a large number. So this is massively degenerate. In contrast, if you take a random point set, with high probability, you get all unique distances. And this is more like proteins. So when you think about structures like this, which are kind of typical in chemistry, as compared to uh, structures like this, which maybe are more like uh, random polymers or proteins, they're, they're quite different. So we've developed two sets of algorithms, um, one algorithm to address this case and a different algorithm to look at that case. The generalization to, uh, generalization to vectors is, is, is written here. Um, if we were able to orient this so that we have uh, an atom there, we could say, well, now I have a set of distances uh, which, which have two components, and I could write the, the list. Let's say I gave you this list. Could, would it be easy to reconstruct? And the answer is there's a lot more information in here than in the original uh, scalar distance list. You can also write down in the analogous thing in matrix form, and we could ask about matrix completion. Let's say I gave you these vectors and only some of them. Then I could ask all the questions that have been asked about distance geometry about this vector case. And this is completely unexplored at this point, but I think it's, well, maybe I think it is. <laughs> you it's easier to solve, yeah. And it maps to the other case. The, you know, one, the one question that there is no answer to is once you have these things and you map it to the scalar case with implied edges, there are correlations. So then the question is, does that change things? That's really the way to pose it. Uh, and again, these are the kind of problems uh, we're looking at. So yesterday, uh, Henry spoke about uh, sensor uh, cases, sensor localization. And this was, was an example of that. Not his example, but somebody else's. Uh, our work in this area is based on uh, uh, earlier work by Bruce Hendrickson, where he was looking at graph rigidity. And he knew a lot about these kind of build-up methods. There is a, um, a couple of papers by Dong and Wu. Wu uh, is at uh, Purdue. And um, they wrote down some equations to show that if you take configurations like this where you have exactly k plus 1 edges and you add one node, you can get a unique position provided the points that you build from, the k plus 1 points you build from, are not in a lower dimensional manifold. So they have to be in the same dimension as the, the embedding. So if I were to take three points in a line here, and add that point, obviously there's a reflection, so it's not globally rigid, but if these three points that I connect to are not in a line, then there's no reflection and there's a unique reconstruction. With that constraint, you can write down the equations for this new position and find that position uniquely. So there's an explicit way to find it. There's a set of equations, and you can do that in three dimensions as well. Uh, in the cases where we only add uh, two bonds there, then you have the possibility of uh, discretizable cases. So uh, the only difference between them is one edge. So now the, the experimental situation. So in the, um, the case of the nanostructure problem, um, the method that uh, is, is, is used by Simon for systems that are not crystalline is called the pair distribution function method. And it's just the same scattering data that we've always looked at from synchrotron beamlines. You take a sample and uh, you, you irradiate with x-rays, you take the diffraction data, but now you do an angle average 
instead of looking at the three-dimensional Bragg peaks, you do an angle average. And what you end up with is uh, called the structure factor. And um, the structure factor uh, is plotted here. Um, <coughs> then if you do a Fourier transform of that, it's possible to show that you get something called the pair distribution function. The pair distribution function has a set of peaks and those set of peaks gives you the probability of finding a distance. So this peak measures a distance in our structure. And you look at this, there's a whole bunch of peaks and as usual in an experiment, you've got to do some analysis to figure out which ones you trust. The amplitude of these peaks is proportional to the scattering strength of the atoms contributing to it and their multiplicity. So there's some analysis needs to be done there. So in this particular case, this was the scattering from a crystalline sample of fullerenes. It was an FCC crystal. And these peaks here are peaks corresponding to inside a fullerene. This peak here, which is not as strong, corresponds to the next fullerene, the neighbor. What you can see is that once you get beyond the size of an individual fullerene, everything washes out. And this was a very famous example. In fact, if you go to lower temperatures, you see these peaks uh, reappear. What happens is that as you raise the temperature of a crystalline fullerene system, the, the fullerene start to rotate. And so you wash out the internal structure between fullerenes. All you see is the center of the fullerenes. And what's left is just the internal structure of individual fullerenes. So if you take this and do some uh, data analysis, you end up with this, and then from this you can extract that. That's what Simon first brought to me. He brought this to me. Uh, and we tried optimization methods. He tried optimization methods, and they didn't get anywhere. We eventually wrote a Nature paper on this. That's this paper here. And we collaborated with some people in computer science. They used genetic algorithms to try and solve this problem by fussing around with the genetic algorithms and tuning all the variables, they were able to get some solutions. But we developed an alternative build-up method, but it's stochastic build-up. There's uncertainties. There's lots of differences between this and the picture I showed earlier of an ideal fullerene. Nevertheless, this is what our algorithm gave. So you can see there's a sequence of build-ups, and finally we end up with something that really is a fullerene. So this told us that somehow this problem, this unassigned distance geometry problem that we thought was impossible in experimental cases is possible. And that was uh, quite surprising to me and to him. So how does it work? Uh, as I mentioned, there's two algorithms that we have. One is one that's more focused on um, where there's unique distances. And I'll talk about that one first. As I mentioned, there are cores that we build from. And in two dimensions, the core is uh, four atoms, and as you see here, uh, six edges. And in three dimensions, it is uh, five atoms and uh, whatever number of edges that is, k outside of k minus one over two. And um, the problem we have is that we have a list of distances. We have no information about um, assignments. So we have to search our distance list. So we if we have 100 atoms, our distance list is 100 times 99 over 2, which is a large number. So we have a problem of searching through that entire set to find what are called compatible distances. Somewhere in there, there's a core. In fact, there's many such cores. But the number of them compared to all possible combinations and permutations is very small. So we have to do a search and find compatible distances to find a core. And that's the most difficult part of the, the most time-consuming part of the algorithm. <coughs> so here's the uh, statement. Um, the, the, okay, so there, there, there is one other thing I have to mention here. There is the possibility that we can find a compatible set of distances to form a core, right? but it may not exist in the final structure. According to global rigidity, it should be there. But these distances then are not generic. They don't exist in the final structure, but by chance, 
they fit together and are compatible. The likelihood of that is low and it will lead to incorrect reconstruction later on. In fact, we've never seen it, but in principle it could occur and we can construct distance lists where it does occur. But we have to be aware that we have to make this statement. A generic, uh, a distance list is generic if there's only a certain number of cores that can be found, namely the number of such cores that occur in the final reconstruction, right? The original structure has a certain number of configurations that are cores, and we cannot have more than that uh, available. So in order to test if a list is generic, we've got to search for all cores, which is prohibitive, and we've never done it, but in principle we could. Uh, let's assume we have generic lists where we don't have this possibility of a non-generic uh, core or reconstruction at any point. Then we can make this statement. We, it, we have a, a unique construction if for each added site, the K plus one sites in the existing structure do not lie in a Euclidean uh, subspace of dimension less than K. This is arbitrary dimension. <coughs> And the distance list is complete, generic, and precise. So that's the statement that if those properties are true, we can reconstruct uh, from the distance list, an unassigned distance list. So that's, this is the generalization of what, what you know, is triangulation in two dimensions or uh, growth adding one site at a time for the assigned distance geometry. And the implementation of that is tri-bond, just does that. And you can do a calculation of what the bound on the algorithm is, and a very uh, loose upper bound is to say, well, that's what, how much uh, time does it take to do the combinatorial search to find the core? The core is the rate limiting step, and you just work out the combinatorics of finding the right number of edges to fit together to make a compatible structure, and it's easy to see that you get something, it's not so easy to see that that's the right exponent, but it's clear that this thing is polynomial. So that was a surprise to me. When we first looked at n factorial as the number of permutations and combinations of assignment of the whole graph, it's ridiculously large. If you do it a piece at a time, four or five atoms at a time, it's not, it's polynomial. So that's a big surprise. Unassigned distance geometry is not as hard as we thought, at least for the precise case, with enough edges <laughs> to do the reconstruction. <clears throat> uh, okay. So where am I? <laughs> uh, so uh, let's say we, we end in 25 minutes. Okay, sounds good. All right. Um, okay. So that's, that's, uh, the, for, uh, that's the um, formal basis of it. Now let's see how it works. <clears throat> so here are results for random point sets in the plane. So what we do is we generate a set of um, random points, and up, this is up to 512 random points. We take all of the distances, we put them in a distance list, we run this algorithm, and we always find the right answer for this number of distances. We've gone larger and it has failed due to precision problems occasionally. And the more uh, uh, points you have, the worse it becomes. But if you do a random restart, we can find an answer. And the problem occurs because as you go to larger distance lists, you get distances that are very close in uh, length and that causes uh, problems because you'll choose the wrong distance at the wrong time. Um, so what this says is, okay, um, this axis here is, is a measure which is independent of the computational system. It, it tells us how many times we have to check for this additional bond which enforces global rigidity. Um, and this is the growth of that as a function of the number of sites. And you can see on a log-log graph, this is close to a straight line. And the exponent is about 3.3. So you know for the assigned distance geometry problem, that exponent is 1. Hey, nobody's asking any questions. I've been talking a long time. <laughs> uh, 
So this, this exponent is 3.3. .3. The theoretical exponent is much larger than that. But in practice, this is, this is pretty, uh, pretty good. So this could be pushed out quite a bit larger, but we're starting to have these imprecision problems. So there's probably something there if we really want to push this to a practical algorithm. Uh, we'd need to check on those imprecise distances. And I think the obvious way to do that would be just search the list and avoid doing anything with distances that are close. It's a pretty obvious thing to do. And there's strategies like that that could be done to curate distance lists. And here's the timing. So 1,000 takes us about a day on a laptop. So this is not a hard problem. In fact, it's starting to look quite easy. So sensor layout, well, at least up to 1,000, we could do with this kind of algorithm, even if the sensors are not aligned. Uh, <coughs> and the other thing is, the core reconstruction, which is this part, is quite a bit harder than the buildup, which is this part. So once we have that first four atoms, uh, we can build up very quickly. So if there are anchors in a sensor array, they're the core. We can build from those, and we'd be on this line, which is about a factor of 50 to 100 lower than, the, than finding the core. It also tells us that when we're having problem finding the true structure from distances, we have to be very, very careful with the small pieces. We, gotta, we have to get the small pieces right and then build up from there. And I think for that reason, there's a lot of opportunities for distance geometry to have a big impact on structure determination in general. Because a lot of the methods that are based on diffraction and inverting diffraction uh, get the global structure first and then they start to focus in more and more on the fine-grained resolution. I was thinking about your notion of genericity. Um, I don't know, is it, is it the same as what we used to call generic in rigidity? No, I think it's different. It's different? Yeah. But, uh, so in these kind of uh, data sets that you use, you have multiplicities of distances. Yeah. You're right. And exactly. So this is a big problem. Well, it is. It appears not to be such a big problem, but yeah. it should be a big problem for this, for this method. It, it is a problem for the method, for sure, and particularly in crystalline materials right. where there's a lot of uh, structure. So, but, so but then again, in, a, in another sense, if you have many distances that, are, that have the same length, the same value, uh, even if you take a few of them and they, they click together in a core, yeah. you will find that core with high probability. From a certain point of view, I think it's bad, but from another, I don't know, I, I think it's, it's also good in a certain sense in order to, yeah. to get the, the wrong core. Yeah, yeah. No, I, you know, I, I <coughs> we've been thinking along the same lines. I haven't pursued that uh, line of thought, but it's possible to curate the distance list, to choose a subset mm. from which we can build cores that don't have this problem with degeneracy. But if we just blindly go ahead and choose cores, some of them will have this problem. Is it possible? Yeah. Why shouldn't two nodes end up on top of each other? Well, they shouldn't if in the original structure they weren't. So the statement is, if we have n a generic uh, distance list, we will at all stages have the correct reconstruction. So that whatever we construct had to be in the original structure. And if there were no two vertices on top of each other, we won't find them. Things, of course, can go wrong and, and lead to the problems, but you know, the theory says we shouldn't have that problem. If you have generic lists. If we have generic lists. In your case, you, you're not likely to have generic lists in, in, in theoretical terms, so uh, I think it's common, was, was relevant. It, is, it certainly, certainly is relevant, yeah. Many equal distances. Yeah, yeah. And no. that makes it, in my experience, that makes it easy for, for, uh, you know, for points to be on top of each other, if you have all, all equal distances. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That is true. So, so there has, yeah, as we said, there has to be a strategy to avoid that and you have to curate the list to make sure it doesn't happen. Sure. So you can imagine a square lattice, that's an example where you, where you have that problem. Yeah, non-genetic, yeah, so exactly, yeah. So 
the noise makes it worse because now we can have wrong configurations due to non-generic and also noise. And so uh, that's not fully solved in, in a formal sense. But I showed you before we solved for the fullerene. So there has to be some new strategies there to handle problems like this. And that's mostly to do with the uncertainty part, you know, the stochastic part. So I'll get to that in a second, some strategies to handle that that we've used for fullerenes. Um, let me just say before we do that, uh, we've done the three-dimensional case, random point sets in three dimensions. Um, and this was done at the very end of my grad student's career, so he didn't do everything I asked him to do. <laughs> So when he did this check of core building versus uh, build up, this is the three dimensional version. He only went up to 12 vertices. So, but it's very clear that they're very different in, uh, in timing. So it's hard to find that core in three dimensions because it's bigger. And once you have that many edges, the combinatorics of it goes, goes uh, you know, is raised to a high power, basically goes dimension squared. And uh, so this, even though this is polynomial in theory, the polynomial exponent is large. However, he did manage to do the calculation of the time to reconstruct uh, three-dimensional point, random point sets up to 100, unassigned. And uh, the exp he, could, he, you know, four points, a bit dodgy, but <laughs> you can get an exponent out of that. It actually looks like the exponent's decreasing at higher size, but this exponent is about five. So it's large, but not impossible. So if you really wanted to use this for proteins or something like that, you know, once we get to four or five hundred, that's kind of interesting. Um, so a hundred he did at the last minute. Uh, and at the same time, I asked him to look at, uh, you know, let's start looking at imprecision. Let's make these distances uncertain. On this axis here is the degree of uncertainty. So this is the uncertainty 10 to the minus 8 in each distance. Unassigned distances still. This is 10 to the minus 4 in the unassigned distances. And he had to do something to, to try to, to, to make it work. And he was doing this. He was adding more distances to try to constrain the positions of each added edge. He also wrote a version of this where he added two edges, uh, two vertices at the same time, and a whole bunch of distances related to those. And he would do both and check to see which one led to a better reconstruction. So here's what he found. And this, again, was, uh, this was. Um, this was, uh, this was at the last minute, so, but it looked kind of promising. So the way he did it was he had a core of a certain size, and then he looked at the effect of imprecision in the distances, and then there were certain size systems he could reconstruct given a certain size core and a certain size imprecision. So down to about 10 to the minus 6, he was able to reconstruct once the imprecision became larger than that, he had to increase the size of the core to give himself more distances with which to work. This is the first step. But it says it's not impossible. We showed this to Simon, and he said, <laughs> 10 to the minus 4. You're not really talking to experimentalists if you've got 10 to the minus 4. The imprecision in the PDF data is typically 10 to the minus 2. So there's a long way to go here. And if you look at NMR, it's even worse. 10 to the minus 1, just 10, 10. <laughs> 50%. Yeah. So, you know, first steps. Uh, that was the scattering data I showed you before. Pair distribution function PDF. Yeah. yeah. It's so many different things. Yeah. Okay. So now we got to, this algorithm was actually uh, developed before the one I just described. The Tribon one came later. This was dis developed first with Simon, and we talked for many, many hours about how to get this thing to work. We just happened to have a really good computer guy with us at the time. And he came up with all sorts of tricks of the trade to get this to work. And so it's got lots of pieces to it, and it's hard to tell you all the details. Um, it is online, so we have a paper where the frozen version of the code is given. An input data set is given, so the source is there, an outline of what it does is there, an input data set, and an output data set is all there. Um, but the idea is this. Yeah? But this is only for this purpose. Did you do it for that? No, we haven't done that yet, no. In fact, my effort at code development stopped about five years ago because my student graduated and left, and I'm not funded for this work, so I don't have a new student or postdoc. 
<coughs> but even this stuff here, this also stopped because Simon moved to Brookhaven. He now has his own beam line, and he's trying to get it going again. He still has the same postdoc, but that postdoc's doing other things. So <laughs> we, we keep on talking about writing a new grant, but we've both been very busy. And there's so many things we've learned since then, I think we can write a much better algorithm now. We had no idea about the tribon stuff at that point. We didn't even know what the core size, critical core sizes were. So a lot of what happened in the Liga algorithm was that early stage of finding a valid core failed. And so there were many, many fails, failures at very small sizes. We didn't understand why. We, That's ridiculous. That should be easy. It just kept on failing. And once you, what happened in the algorithm, I'll show you in a sec, you, you find this core, and then suddenly it just grows. And you go, what? what? <laughs> we had no theoretical idea of why that was at the time. We thought there was some bug in the program. <clears throat> but it turns out, based on rigidity theory, uh, there's a reason. So how, this is how it works. You start with an empty box. You, you put down a vertex. You, you, you connect an edge to it. And then you start to stochastically try to add another vertex and two edges in two dimensions and three edges in three dimensions. So it's not globally rigid. It was working with uh, locally rigid structures. And because there are, is uncertainty in these distance lists, um, it's done stochastically. So when we add each vertex, we can have a cost function related to how far from a correct and compatible vertex they are. And so for each cluster, you can go to each vertex and, I, and give it a cost. And that cost is related to how far off the edges are from compatible. So compatible means they fit perfectly. Incompatible means they don't. And for every cluster, every vertex, you can associate a cost. So the idea of the algorithm is, OK, we're going to stochastically add these edges. We're going to give a cost to each vertex. And then we're going to have a tournament. We're going to have, say, 10 clusters of each size. And we're going to take each of them. We're going to try to add another vertex to it. And if we find a, a low-cost vertex, we promote it to the next size up. Then we go and look at the worst one in the uh, upper one, and we take off the wor uh, worst vertex, and we demote it. So it's a bit like the soccer leagues in Europe, promotion and relegation in soccer leagues. That's why it's called Liga. Liga is the Spanish soccer league, and it's got a better name than the Premier League. No. Yeah. <laughs> Simon's from England, and he loves the Premier League. Oh, yeah, and, he, and, he, and he barracks for the Gunners, and he hates the Spanish league. <laughs> So his postdoc called it Liga. <laughs> so uh, this is an example of uh, building a core, and there's backtracking, as I mentioned. Here's an example of a bad configuration. And we get relegation that removes one of those guys, and then uh, a reconstruction occurs. Here's an illustration of the tournament process, relegation, and there are a bunch of other things that occur. Once we find a very low uh, cost case in a particular level, then we get a rapid promotion process to see if we can push that all the way to the top without leaving it sit there for a long time because stochastically it might get deleted. So it's a very stochastic process, and, and cases we didn't want to, uh, to get removed uh, were, were treated. So um, as I mentioned before, this is the input data. There's the distance list, and this is the process, and we end up with, uh, with the full array. OK. Um, this is kind of like universal rigidity, but um, in, in regular systems, we have to worry about um, the uniqueness. And in two dimensions, you would say, hey, this thing, if we have a complete graph, if I give you these distances, according to graph rigidity, there should be enough edges for a unique realization. And in the plane, there is. But actually, if you allow uh, going into three dimensions, all three of these configurations are compatible with uh, this distance list. And there's a whole field um, of study, in fact, the early studies of diffraction, Patterson worried about this, about whether diffraction patterns can reproduce structure uniquely. So there's a whole set of structures called homometric sets, 
where you can talk about stuff like this, where you get degeneracy. And there's, there's applications of things like polytypes, where if you have particular uh, one-dimensional structures, you can do the scattering from them, and the scattering alone cannot find the structure because it's uh, degenerate. And then you uh, have to do higher order kind of analysis to try to figure out what the correct structure is. So that's something we always have to keep in mind. Now let's talk about vectors. And uh, <coughs> it, it's, it's, it's kind of straightforward. In the plane, we can say, OK, if I do something like this, um, this is, uh, if I add this side and two vertices, I can always rotate this over uh, reflection. If I have a vector and I have the angle and the distance, um, then I can go to another configuration over here, but um, I only need one edge uh, because there's an implied distance here. I don't think I drew that right. That should be over here. <laughs> uh, but there's an implied distance here, and I can rotate that over. So that's the statement here. If we have some angle, there's an implied edge. And if that's the case, we can go through the same arguments about uh, you know, how long, what's the computational efficiency of um, this vector percolation case. And so we have uh, the opportunity now to, to develop this algorithm which is basically tri-bond, but now with vectors. Speaking to some of the experimentalists, they tell me they believe they can, they can give us some vectors. So we can uh, ask them to work on certain vector inputs, some distance inputs, and also some local structures that might be precise. If we get those things, it really improves our chances of, of getting a reconstruction. <clears throat> okay, so here's, uh, here's some conclusions. Interpoint distances and or vectors in many problems are available to determine atomic structure, sensor placement, radar, sonar, etc. And I keep on telling people who do diffraction kind of lensless imaging and inversion of diffraction patterns in Fourier space that we really should have technologies that are based on distance lists as a comp a complementary approach. It, it provides a check. It's the same data, but you can just uh, get the distances out of it, and that would lead to the possibility of many kind of algorithms where you go between one and the other and try to do the inside part of the structure and the outside part of the structure and then work to make them compatible. Uh, for precise, generic, complete distance lists, the unassigned distance geometry problem is in P. Provided we have the things I said before, generic, complete, and precise. We're at the point now where we're really starting to think about the uh, uncertainty problem and how we can handle that in a, in a better way. And I think there's lots of work going on here that's showing some real promising directions. So you need something else for the you need K to be fixed. Yes, I need K to be fixed, yeah. yeah, yeah. <coughs> Uh, so vector buildup is easier than build up from distances. So if there's any opportunity to get distances or anchors or locally rigid domains that you understand well, and that also leads to other possibilities. For example, chemists often put a motif into a polymer that they know well, and they can tell us the structure of that motif, and then we can do experiments to find edges that are related to it, and we can build up from that. It means that we have to work with experimentalists to design the experiments to optimize the algorithms that work best with the experimental output that they get. And there are discretizable variants for both uh, scalar and vector cases. And as, as uh, Leo said, that's in, in many cases a very interesting thing to worry about to get not one solution, but a family of solutions, particularly in proteins. And here's my list of favorite Challenges. <clears throat> I'd like to know what the relation of the vector geometry problem is to EDM, because there are correlations in the distance matrix. Uh, I would like 
to see some more down on the mapping of this combinatorial problem to continuous optimization. And Luis is going to talk about his approach in the last talk today, and I think that's very promising. It's an area where we can work to reduce the time it takes to find the core. And if we can do that, that will really speed up the algorithm. That's, what, that's the rate limiting step, so that's where we should concentrate. Uh, working with intervals, one approach is to add one site in a build up process and more than k plus one distances, and it would be great to get some formal results in that area. You know, For a given interval, how many extra edges do we need to add? And then the, the one that I mentioned just now is what is the right combination of local and global methods for DGPs? My experience is that we have no chance of these reconstructions with purely global. global. We have to have some local, precise local information to speed things up, particularly in large structures. But I think the global methods can also provide vital information that is unavailable with the local methods because when we build up local methods, we get imprecision problems. So I think the combination is probably uh, very fruitful. So with that, uh, I'd like to say thanks very much for listening. Um, so you're given a bunch of vectors. Yeah. What is the structure compatible with a bunch of vectors? So let, let's go back to the original graph. Mm -hmm. And let's say I have a framework. So I actually have, you know, exactly the directions between each of it. And so the experimental input is those vectors. Ah, okay, it's richer. Okay. It's richer. It's richer, yeah. And so you could say I know the x component, the y component, and the z component of each line between two vectors. Uh, two points. A and currently, the pair distribution function is being generalized to do that. So they're calling it vector okay. PDF. I see. So then uh, a trivial link is to ignore the vector and just take the, the length. Yeah, of, the of course. <laughs> yes. So why were you hinting that then there are more links? You said correlation. Oh, yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's say I have a, 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 this graph. And my experimental friend tells me he knows that this is the vector between, or that this vector exists. Uh, then I know this vector has this x component and that y component, which is why I wrote in there, you know, a vector, x and y component. So now I'm going to give you a list of those, and I want you to reproduce this. Now you could just go back and say, okay, I'm going to make the distance is my only information, but that you're throwing away half the information. Because now I have two constraints for each vector. So that becomes a new problem. And it's clearly more information than from just the scalar. Does, is, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. I think that maybe you can, uh, you can have three, well, k in general, a one-dimensional uh, problems on a line. Oh. And then you have to find, with this new data, uh, with these three realizations, a yeah. listing of this in three dimensions. Yeah, th th that's one way to approach it, yeah. In fact, the original um, graph rigidity problem, people were thinking in those terms and making spanning trees, you know, yeah. merging them to try to characterize rigidity. And it was a similar way. There's uh, several degrees of freedom that are propagating, and you have to have them work together. that picture there, I think your comment about if the points in the clique were on line, then you got a difficulty. Yep. I think to, so that I think that maybe the tiding there also is that if they weren't quite on line, yep. almost on line, yep. then you've got a problem with numerical analysis yep. and linear algebra. Yep. So a lot of the linear algebra, so solving these problems, you said you have equations, but we don't know what equations you're using because a lot of being able to solve these problems, deciding in which equations you're yeah. using. Yeah. So that's why I think if you use one point, yeah. you can end up with a build up, a ground up there. Yeah, you can. Whereas if instead of that single point was was a separate clique in itself. Yeah. So if you built up a separate clique. Yeah. And then that separate clique would have many connections. Yeah. 
And so, to, of course, it would be less likely all yeah. these connections would need to be aligned. Yeah. And then the linear algebra then wouldn't have, uh -huh. then you're taking the intersection of uh, two different equations. Yeah. And uh, it would be more robust. Yeah. Yep. In, yep. The, in, in being able to solve for the. I agree. No, the that's it. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, in, <laughs> in fact, the next generation algorithm would say, I'm going to look for the three connecting sites that are least planar. You can just check. But the round off question is, is, is a very serious question. As you go to a larger size, uh, that problem accumulates. And, and that's uh, why uh, when we were talking about that river. Yeah. It's not so much that you can't solve, but the round off right. area Get you in the end, yeah. Now, we did go to very, very high precision, and we tried to write this in mathematic with arbitrary precision to see if we could, you know, see how bad the buildup was. But by the time you get to 1,000 in a random system, we've got a problem. We know that. But as I mentioned before, there's ways to curate the distance list to try to minimize it and also do, as I said here, avoid the connectors. But I, I think your approach is probably also a, a great way to look at it. So I, I think we have time for one more question. Just a quick question. So Correct. Yes. So is the symmetry group now, is this determined prior to all of these calculations? Uh, for this particular set of experimental data, yes. It was an FCC crystal uh, for, for the interparticle fullerenes. Um, but the interest here was to take the uh, distances from inside the particle. And it was advantageous to have it rotating so there was no confusion about distances between particles and distances within the particle. But, but it's still, the, the, it's a crystal, right? So yeah. the, there is a periodic pattern there. Yeah, but that's not used that's in, not used. Not used no. And the symmetry group is not used no, in any no, way. No, no, no. Correct. You're just working things in some Exactly. In fact, that was one of the things that we emphasized in the paper, that there was no information even about the number of atoms. So what we looked at was the way that the cost grew as we kept on adding atoms from the, oh, sorry, I should back up a little. There was a bunch of tricks. So one of the tricks was we didn't give it the precise multiplicity that the distance list gave us. We gave some, he called it looseness in the DAT. So then there's the possibility of growing a bigger structure. But then if you look at the cost as the structure grows, <clears throat> it blows up once it gets beyond 60, which is the fuller range. And it's because the distances of the length of a bigger structure were not in the list. And so it's very hard to grow them. And so the, the algorithm was, at, was robust to, to not having the number of atoms and only having these imprecise distance lists. Nothing else was used. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you very much. Let's give a <clears throat>